<clears throat> Hem. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to the new 302. Uh, today is the 5th of November. This is the uh, last immediate lecture, lecture before the fall reading week, which I can only imagine people are very much looking forward to. I was finding it a little peculiar that the fall reading week, I mean, took U of T quite some time to actually get one. Uh, and then once they did, they placed it very far back in the semester, right? So, you know, two thirds of the semester or more uh, is over by the time we get here. Uh, other schools have it a bit more in the middle. But um, anyway, be that as it may, I imagine that people are uh, quite looking forward to that. Um, you know, both for <clears throat> the opportunity to relax a bit, but also the opportunity to catch up a bit. Uh, and I do hope that you fairly strongly favor the former over the latter. Um, right, the 5th of November. So today's topic is crossroads and thresholds. And that's going to that's gonna cover a, a bunch of things, um, some of which are uh, quite topical. So the first thing that I'll say uh, is um, uh, that the 5th of November is Guy Fox Day. And uh, so for those of you that, you know, aren't, aren't familiar with this, this is an English tradition. Um, if you've ever seen the film uh, V for Vendetta, uh, it's, <clears throat> uh, it's discussed there at least uh, a bit. So the idea with Guy Fox Day in England, um, it's a day where, among other things, people sort of celebrate by letting off fireworks. But it's a, a day which celebrates, um, essentially speaking, uh, an, an English, uh, although funded by papal powers, uh, attempt to blow up the English parliament buildings, the British parliament. Um, so <clears throat> it comes with a traditional, they light off fireworks and the plot was foiled. Uh, you will note that the British parliament buildings are still there in London. Uh, the plot was foiled. But um, nevertheless, it endures and, and has from 17th century on, uh, most notably in this, this English rhyme. Uh, so many of you be, will be familiar with this, at least in part, right? It goes, <clears throat> remember, remember the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason, and plot. I see no reason the gunpowder treason should ever be forgot, right? So that's the kind of basics. And if you watch the film V for Vendetta, or even better, read the comic, um, the film was a pretty good adaptation, but the comic, as is often the case, was better. Um, so if you read it, you will get something of a potted history of, of that event around Guy Fox, the conspirator who was <clears throat> working for uh, Catholic papalists to sort of blow up the parliament building. But let me read you the whole, let me read you the whole uh, nursery rhyme real quick or not, not nursery rhyme, I guess, but it's a traditional English rhyme. Okay. <clears throat> remember, remember the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason, and plot. I see no reason why gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. Guy Fox, Guy Fox, twas his intent to blow up the king and the parliament. Three score barrels of powder below, poor old England to overthrow. By God's providence, he was catched with a dark lantern and a burning match. Hola, boys, hola, boys, God save the king, hip, hip, hooray, hip, hip, hooray. A penny loaf to feed old Pope, a farthing cheese to choke him, a pint of beer to rinse it down, a faggot of sticks to burn him, burn him in a tub of tar, burn him like a blazing star, <clears throat> burn his body from his head, then we'll say, old Pope is dead, hip, hip, hooray, hip, hip, hooray. Um, quick note, in case you're not familiar with this, uh, <clears throat> faggot is an English term for a bundle of sticks. It didn't have the colloquial North American uh, association with uh, uh, homosexuality as a slur uh, uh, at the time. Uh, incidentally, um, this gets us very close to the funny parallel universe, I've always thought, where English, uh, so fascism, right? The symbol of fascism <laughs> is a bundle of sticks. The, the fascis, right, is a bundle of sticks. It's, it's an Italian concept. So one stick breaks easy, a bunch of sticks together, right? Can't be broken. So the bundle of sticks as a way of organizing your society, right? And so that's where the term fascism comes from. It means bundle of sticks, which means that there is some nearby parallel universe in which uh, of course, the course of fascism in England, which did catch on before World War II and then kind of got squashed, 
uh, was instead called faggotism, which I suspect is something that um, would substantially irk a large number of fascists. Um, <clears throat> Uh, maybe not. Uh, England still uses the term to denote cigarette, which definitely isn't a thing in North America here either. Okay, so the 5th of November. Now, the 5th of November is mm, interesting to me. Um, it's interesting because it celebrates a certain kind of thing. It celebrates, you know, the foiling of the plot, ostensibly, but it does so by, um, you know, blowing things up. <laughs> it does so with fireworks, right? And there is a very clear line um, that you can pick up sort of within the British consciousness around Guy Fawkes Day, which is this thinly concealed desire to blow it up, right? Not just to parliament, but like society, blow it up, right? I think that's a powerful force. I mean, there's a sense in which <clears throat> Freud was discussing this sort of thing when he talked about Thanatos, the death, the death drive, right? Um, which, as I pointed out before, he actually stole to some extent from uh, uh, Sabina Spielrein. Um, <clears throat> but you know, this this desire to blow it up or burn it down uh, is a very powerful kind of drive when it comes to society. We're ambivalent about society, you know. Okay, so I got a few things that I want to say in this respect because we are talking about cross holds and uh, cross holds and thresh no <laughs> crossroads and thresholds um and uh i'm gonna try to to draw this together but it's in some sense a set of speculations um the first thing that i'll say is i'll reiterate <clears throat> that the the hearing of voices statistically is not uncommon uh and it is uh, actually infrequently uh linked to um schizophrenia Rather, people, of course, hear voices under all kinds of contexts. They hear voices if they are sufficiently sleep deprived, for instance, but they can also hear voices if they're in isolation or sensory deprivation long enough, right? And sometimes those things just occur spontaneously, right? Um, sometimes voices they know, sometimes voices they don't. So I mentioned my, uh, my friend, my ex, um, who has heard the voice of her mother. And full disclosure, I've heard voices too. So there have been a handful of occasions, not a lot, but a handful of occasions where when I was embarking on some course of action, sometimes just in moments of quiet repose, I, I heard something really quite distinct, right? Um, I've had other kinds of sort of unconscious incursions. Some of you who um, have come to sort of online discussion have heard me talk about um, the, the paper, the sociology paper that I once wrote. Um, which was sort of, uh, you know, handed to me uh, by my unconscious, more or less fully formed. Um, it did not feel like it was a product of my own mind at all. And indeed, you know, as a, as a creative writer, right, so um, I write novels, I write poetry, have done for many years. Um, and so, you know, in doing writing, it is not uncommon and artistic endeavors generally, it's not uncommon to have the sense that something is coming through you rather than you producing it. Um, I have a theory about that in part, uh, which is a neurologically based theory, but the, you know, the experience as a whole uh, tends to sort of outstrip your, your theories on the ground when you have it. So to give an example, I was once heading into a, a job interview uh, at a at a call center. I, at the time, was a writer. Being a writer is uh, not a well-paying profession, and I was renting a house up north to myself. So you know, I was living living alone in this house, working kind of full time, um, for two and a half years. Um, <clears throat> if you're picturing The Shining, um, yeah, I mean that's not quite right, but it's maybe not entirely wrong either. It was definitely like something of a of a straining environment, let's say. So. Anyway, uh, finally, I was getting a bit pinched, and I decided that I needed this job, and they <clears throat> they had paid training. So, you know, I I walked up there. I was sufficiently poor. This is in a small town, northern Ontario. I was sufficiently poor that I didn't really have the cash to spare for, um, like, transit money. Um, I didn't own a car. had a motorcycle, uh, but it was <clears throat> not insured at the time. I was pretty poor. And so I'm making my way to this call center job. And this, this was for a big American cable company, Comcast. <clears throat> so, you know, my job, <clears throat> essentially speaking, pardon me, 
I'm going to clear my throat a lot. Um, my job, essentially speaking, was going to be sort of customer service, right? People with internet downages and trying to address their things. And this, uh, you know, at the time did not strike me as wildly interesting. Um, it wasn't wasn't in line with my, my career aspirations, but it's like, well, got to pay rent, got to eat. Um, yeah. So, so I'm hiking up there, basically. Um, and it was, you know, maybe an hour walk. It was cold uh, and exceptionally windy and like really, really windy. Like the, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fellow. Um, but for people who were smaller, like I could see them, you know, it's like their coat was billowing out. It was like, turn your umbrella inside out weather, but, you know, coat billowing out and watching people, you know, turn into like human kites, uh, not literally flying away, but certainly like being pushed back and struggling. So it was that kind of windy day. And so I made my way across the city in this like remarkably high wind and hiked up and out um, sort of past the city limits to where this, uh, where this place was. And I was crossing a set of parking lots and I was almost there when all of a sudden I heard, I heard this uh, voice, basically, I, I heard it. Um, and it said, you know, uh, quite clearly to me um, with this sort of I didn't mistake it for a person, nor incidentally did I mistake it for, you know, God or something, although that would have been, I think, a closer match. Uh, but, it, but it basically said, <clears throat> quote, quote, your need to seek conventional employment represents a profound failure of the imagination. Full stop. So this happens and <laughs> I'm a bit thrown by it. Um, maybe not so thrown as some people, but thrown. Um, and, you know, I paused and I was like, well, like, that's easy for you to say, <laughs> you know, like, I got to pay my bills. Uh, and I did end up going to that place. But, you know, as an event, it, it stuck with me. Uh, I did the paid training and I uh, got it after the paid training. Um, more recently, I mean, that's uh, obviously a sort of something of a high stress and, and an unusual kind of environment. But more recently, a few years ago. I found myself, um, as I sometimes do, caught in a cycle of, you know, world anxiety and triangulating in a certain sense, right, between different different kinds of anxiety. But, you know, things that were really bothering me, I was really bothered by the political situation. <clears throat> um, you know, the international political situation struck me as extremely troubling. You know, the international economic situation struck me as extremely troubling. I, um, I have a long familiarity with sort of uh, economic and energy-based theories of, of um, social collapse. So this is something that concerns me, right? And so the environment, the economy, um, and sort of the, the, uh, um, the dynamics of, of energy depletion, fossil fuel depletion, very much on my mind. And I was stressed, I was stressed out. I was also working a lot. Um, so I was quite stressed out. And as I like to tell people, I'm not a workaholic. Uh, I just work too much. And this was one of these periods where I was working too much. You know, I like what I do, but I was working too much. And also I was spending my spare time sort of anxiously ripping through these like news cycles. Like I was consuming, um, you know, five or six newspapers, you know, reading, you know, uh, Der Spiegel and The Guardian and Al Jazeera and The New York Times and The Globe and Mail and like it just sort of aggressively consuming newspapers and also aggressively consuming, um, you know, journalism. I like The Atlantic. I read The Atlantic every day, um, you know, and uh, and I could feel it, you know, twisting my guts up. And so then I, I was standing here at home, uh, although I'll be on the other side of the room. And I was looking at my library, which is a thing that I do sometimes. Um, my library is not especially organized. You may be able to tell that if you peruse the titles at some point during these videos. And traditionally, I mean, there's a certain degree of organization these days. You know, the role-playing games are sitting in their own section. Um, you know, the depth psychology is sort of organized together to, to some extent, albeit not, not all of it. I mean, here's a copy of what's that? Archetypal Dimensions of the Psyche on France. So there's revisioning psychology and like those technically should be over there. So you know, it's not, it's not highly organized and, and it, it never has been. And so 
the uh, the effect of this is that very often, if I'm looking for a title, I come across a lot of other titles, uh, and of course, the size of my library long since exceeded um, you know the capacity of my sort of unchunked working memory to possibly have a sense of the totality of what I possess, and so. Um, it's very often a process of discovery. I go looking for something, but in this case, I was standing, um, and, and I wasn't looking for something. It wasn't a case where I went looking for something and sort of found five other things that excited me. Rather, it was sort of this open-ended. I mean, I went from a position of anxiety, to sort of just standing and letting my eyes scan down the titles. And there's something about, I'll say, about having a very large collection of something. Um, for those of you who are collectors, I assume that you'll have sort of comparable feelings. I know people with really big music collections in vinyl and CD, less so digitally, um, tends to be a physical object thing. And likewise, you know, I know people who have like, you know, I don't know, amazing collections of shoes, for instance, or whatever. And there's something about having a large collection where perusing it in this particular way, once it hits a certain size, brings its own, you know, kind of pleasure. There's a a joy in the potentials of it, but also a certain kind of, you know, um, warmth and, and pride, right? This is why uh, I never, <laughs> never really got on with the, the Marie Kondo style minimalism. Uh, unfortunately, it all sparks joy for me. So <clears throat> only option for me is to move into a bigger place. But um, in this case, I, I was standing in front of my library, and I was letting my eyes scan the titles. And, and all of a sudden, I had another one of these like, you know, sort of intrusions as it were, or pronouncements, you know, pronouncements. Uh, and the pronouncement said, um, you should spend less uh, time paying attention to history and more time paying attention to eternity. And, you know, I, that obviously sort of struck me um, as this fully formed dictate and I'm, you know, sufficiently sort of steeped in uh, depth psychological backgrounds to take a statement like that at least reasonably seriously and attempt to figure out what that means. And part of what I thought about what it means is it's like, right, I'm allowing myself to really get immersed in the, the tumult of the present moment. And, you know, I don't think that that should be ignored completely. I really don't. I'm a, I'm a big believer in having a certain amount of attention on news, the state of the world on current events, it's like I believe in it, I try to stay quite current, it's important to me and I consider it to be sort of an, an, an ethical and moral civic duty to, to be informed, right? Um, even when those things are unpalatable, perhaps especially when they're unpalatable and beyond the basic role that I think that one has as a citizen to stay in touch with this kind of thing, right? To, to be able to make reasonable decisions, right? As the citizen of a democracy, I have to have some idea of what's going on, right? Um, and I have to do my level best to attempt to understand things, uh, even things that are somewhat outside of my wheelhouse. But if above and beyond that, I take it um, all the more so, right, that as a university instructor, and even more so as a psychotherapist, that I need to have a certain amount of, you know, thumb on the pulse, a certain amount of thumb, yeah. Anyway, I need to have a certain amount of thumb <laughs> on the pulse, right? And, and that verges pretty widely. It's like I try to keep in contact with, you know, uh, I try to keep in contact with pop culture to a certain extent, right? Which uh, gets harder as time goes by. And I try to keep in contact with slang. Um, so, you know, I try to ask pretty liberally when I'm talking to people if a piece of slang gets used. I don't know what it is. Um, I had the damnedest time trying to pin down the precise usages of the word yeet. Um, it's a very multivalent word, yeet, um, but I successfully deployed it. I mean, I've known about it for a while, but I actually used it spontaneously in a sentence last weekend and it landed and I was right and that pleased me. Anyway, um, you know, so I think it's important to stay current is what I'm saying, right? It's such a, an old man thing to say, but I think it's important to stay current. And, uh, and certainly as regards, you know, the situation of the world, because that tends to be a significant amount of the focus and emphasis of what a client is dealing with, right? Of course, they're dealing with their inner life, but you can't just ignore the outer world, right? Um, again, that transjective quality applies into therapeutic stuff. So the things that are going on in the world affect people. Nevertheless, right, you need to be paying less attention to history and more attention to reality really, or 
reality. Wow, that's a Freudian slip. Less attention to history and more attention to eternity um, was, was what it said, not reality. Anyway, um, you know, it hit me. It still hit me. And I spent a lot of time contemplating what that meant. And I tried to sort of scale back my diet of news, right? I remember the, the Eisenhower, I believe Eisenhower dictate, which is you have to be able to distinguish between the important and the urgent, right? And there's an urgency to the flow of information that comes with sort of current events and, and news, this powerful urgency. And learning to scale back from that urgency, right? In the same way as you have to sometimes scale back from the urgency in your own life, right? Um, all of you, every single one of you here has had the experience of being twisted up in the guts about an assignment or an exam. And one of the things that I learned to internalize over time, right, uh, and, and try to help other people internalize is that in many cases for most assignments, and I don't want to, of course, I don't want to um, say that, you know, university is not important or that grades don't matter, they do, right? You know, your, your GPA can make a difference, although it makes less of a difference, I suspect, in the course of your life than you might think. Um, but, you know, any given, any given assignment, any given test is not a big deal, usually. And what I mean by that is, you know, in five years, when you look back, you won't remember it. There's the odd test that, like, you bomb so thoroughly, right? So thoroughly and abysmally and catastrophically and embarrassingly, typically for lack of preparation, frankly, that like that one will wince haunt you in the night and you will be like, oh my God, oh my God, right? Although a lot of those after five years, you will look back and it'll be like, you'll laugh, you'll laugh, right? Um, in terms of, you know, your ultra high scoring grades, yeah. Every once in a while you write a paper and you think it's great and also you do very well on it. You kill it, you know, you crush it. And yeah, you look back in five years and you're like, that was a good one. And you come across it and you read it maybe and you're like, this was a really good paper. Like, were these my, were these my ideas? And, you know, it's positive. But most of them, five years, you don't even think about them. You won't even remember them. Regardless of whether you did like reasonably well or reasonably poorly, you'll only be interested in the downstream consequences of them, right? But you'll be embroiled in new stuff. The drama of the moment will be the thing that's right up in your face, right? Not some, not some paper. And so, you know, a lot of the time, you know, we get into these situations where the immediacy and urgency of the moment overwhelms us, swamps us, right? Hits us like a, a tidal wave and we're sort of drawn into that. And it's very difficult to put things into perspective in terms of their sort of relative positioning across the timeline of our lives and how much sort of cumulative weight those things are likely to have. So to hear a voice say, you need to be paying less attention to history and more attention to eternity, right? Said to me, you know, and obviously this is going to be a filter depth psych explanation, but it said to me, it's like, maybe it's time to pull back a little bit of your attention from the urgency of current events and news in the present moment and take some of that energy and reinvest it in other places. And one of the places that that energy ended up being invested, you know, sort of the, the green shoots of my psyche at the time was in the making of things. So I had a workshop at the time. I sadly don't have that workshop. I lost the space, but I have a home workshop now, <clears throat> which I've, I uh, commandeered the solarium uh, in my flat and uh, uh, converted it over into a sort of a makeshift workshop. It's very, very vertical, but that's where the 3D printers and the CNC cutters and the laser cutters or CNC covers, laser cutters, uh, all my various tools. I got a stereo in there. Um, computer for doing computerized stuff. I call it the creative center. So it's not a workshop, it's a creative center. But you know, at the time I had a much bigger workshop, which was actually across the hall from my consulting office, uh, same building across the hall, which meant that I could take breaks between clients and go into this space. And also I often stayed after work when in the space. And this space was completely disconnected from the urgency and the requirements of the world. I didn't even have a clock in there, I just had a window. Um, so I could see, was it bright or dark? But otherwise I would absorb myself into the space, make things. And I should add, I'm no great maker of things, right? I did not do well in shop class. Um, I passed, but 
yeah, uh, it's, I'm not strong. I'm a measure things three times, cut once, get it wrong kind of guy. We're not uh, in my family. We're not a handy people, let's say, but I like making things. So I reinvested a big chunk of the energy there. But the other place that I invested it was I invested it quite frankly back into you know, my studies. And my studies not in a like cutting edge kind of way, but rather in going back and reading older things with you know, things that have been around for quite a while and that still have things to say. Goethe, Shakespeare, right? And Jung, things that I've been reading for quite a while and sort of like reinvesting myself into the, the, the long haul of time rather than, and maybe timelessness, things that stand in some sense outside of time, right? Human universals, human realities, um, you know, works of great literature, um, that sort of thing. So, you know, I sort of tried to reinvest my energy, less rabid news consumption. And I got to say, I'm lucky, I think, probably compared to most of you. I'm not a social media user to speak of. Dodged the Facebook bullet and quite happy to have done so. Um, had it for like a week. Girlfriend urged me to get it early on. Had it for like a week. Decided I didn't need it. Have never gone back. Um, don't really use Twitter. Don't use Instagram. Don't, don't, I just don't have those channels of information. Um, I get the stuff because of course people will forward me things, but the way that I always looked at it was, well, mostly when somebody sends a party invitation to 500 friends on Facebook, you know, they get a ton of responses. Most of them aren't really reflective of actual attendance and to get such an invitation doesn't indicate any specific preference for my attendance. On the other hand, if you're not on Facebook and somebody has to send you an email, pretty much if they're sending you an email, it's because they're sending you an email. They want you there. And that allows you to filter your social calendar. You still don't go to everything because you're an introvert. But uh, you nevertheless get to filter your social calendar according to things people actually want you at. Anyway, just saying. So there's a pullback in my energy. Why am I talking about this? It's a real question, I'm sure. Less attention to answer, more attention to maternity. Um, and also, of course, Guy Fox Day. Uh, we're in an interesting week. I don't think I have to tell any of you this. Um, like many people, like many of you, I'm sure, um, certainly like many people around the world, uh, I stayed up inordinately late Tuesday night into Wednesday morning. Um, I was up until 2.30 or 3 in the morning. And I was, of course, up watching the American election, right? And I have a tradition with an old friend of mine from home that we typically get together. We do the American election as a party. It's like our Olympics or Super Bowl or something, right? Because uh, the whole thing really has that quality of looking like sports ball. You know, you're tracking the things and the news commentators are on there and they're like, oh, it looks like they're ahead in points and blah, blah, blah. Never mind that the process actually takes much longer than that and they're just projections. The point is it has that buzz. So where other people get together for the Super Bowl, and make like, you know, giant pan nachos or some people are hardcore for the Olympics. This is what we do. Um, so, you know, we've always gotten together for this thing. COVID being what it is, we can't. We couldn't this year. So we, you know, streamed in to each other via Zoom and kept a separate feed running and I'm running on my projector. He's running on CV and we're talking and we're running commentary and we're making calls about things and we're discussing the situation. We got off the line. Eventually he's got young kids and... Uh, and I stayed up inordinately late watching things. And, you know, obviously this race uh, was a surprise to some people and not a surprise to other people and it's not done yet. Um, the poll projections around this race, right? were wildly inaccurate and people need to ask some questions about why exactly that is. I mean, there are some good reasons why the demography of the, the polling, you know, um, might be off, but the point is, it's like, you know, polling is not, <laughs> isn't working anymore. And that matters for the same reason as I pointed out last week, which is like mm, the, the predictive powers of a thing, right? The predictive powers of a thing often as a construct determine its utility. So if your polling methods are off and you no longer have predictive powers, you get a sense of radical disconnection from the world. It's basically the same thing that's happened to our weather, I add, which is to say that our, you know, weather seems really extreme and unpredictable because that's what everybody says. It's like, wait, you didn't call for rain and now it's raining and it says 100%. That happened to me a couple of weeks ago. And the answer is, yeah, because all of the weather models are based on data that was gathered over the last 
you know, um, give or take a little over 100 years. And since then, we've pushed a lot of extra energy into that system. And so now it's behaving differently and it no longer conforms to the statistical probabilistic models that we built based on the old data. Our models don't fit anymore. And this is what also, obviously, I was talking about when I was talking a little bit about archetypes as circular and predictive, um, as circular and predictive structures for us, things that tell us what the shape of life is supposed to be. Tell us, okay, here's what happened. And so here's probably what's to come. And also like, here's what happened, here's what to come, and here is how to prepare for it or think about it. Here are the questions involved, right? That circularity of, of action and circularity of myth is precisely what gives things utility because you can use them to navigate situations. Unless of course, the system changes in such a way as that those things no longer fit. And as I've mentioned, that's an abiding concern for mine. So in this case too, we see something where the models aren't fitting, right? And the election was, I mean, a lot closer than pollsters at the very least predicted. It remains close, it's still close. So if we wanna talk about crossroads and thresholds, it's a good way to talk about it because it is very much occupying people's consciousness. I was running a Dungeons and Dragons game for some uh, young people, uh, te teens and undergrads that I know through a school. And uh, uh, so they were quite engrossed. They were uh, in the middle of a fantasy gladiatorial match against a giant worm. But simultaneously, um, they were also checking the numbers. And these people are 18, 19. Um, they're talking, you know, excitedly and continuously between each other about the number of electoral college seats that are being picked up in this state or that state and what paths to what are, et cetera, et cetera. And having a surprisingly cogent conversation about the politics of the various candidates and their backgrounds. And it was a degree of political engagement that I have to say was not particularly evidenced among people of the age set when um, I was of the age, right? You know, I was a teenager during the Clinton era, uh, the first Clinton era, and it was a period of, you know, grunge disaffection. It was the 90s. You know, the idea that the political system was sort of completely screwed, and but also that like the Cold War was over and we had won, right? It was when Francis Fukuyama, the historian, published the um, infamously hubristic book, uh, The End of History. And the premise of that book was the Cold War had been won, Soviet Union went down, America was the sole remaining, not even superpower, but hyperpower. Because of that, history was over. Liberal democracy had won. That's it. No meaningful real changes from here. It's just a slow ascent within capitalistic liberal democracy until we get flying cars. Where's my flying car? Anyway, um, it's a trick question, I don't like cars that much, um, but flying motorcycle, flying motorcycle I would take. It sounds insanely dangerous, but a lot of fun. So yeah, so the end of history, that's the era that I was a teen in. To see teens existing in that degree of political engagement was fascinating for me. And I thought, right. And some of this is this like sports ball aspect of American politics, right? that the whole thing is kind of like the Super Bowl, right? Screens and commentators and cutaways and talking heads and right stats and models and right. And it's like, who's the quarterback? Oh yeah, okay. Um, yeah, part of it's that. But part of it is also of course the sense that has really crept into the culture of the question of crossroads and thresholds. So what are we talking about when we talk about those things briefly, okay? Okay, well, what's a crossroad? A crossroad, of course, is where the two roads cross. And crossroads are interesting, right? Because what are they? They're a, they're a choice point, right? You're walking down the road, you come to a crossroad and it's a choice point. You're deciding which way to go, right? And, you know, you see this sometimes extremely dramatically in films, right? They pull up to the thing and you can see a sign pointing this way and a sign pointing this way and they're like, mm, and then they decide to go one way instead of another, right? Uh, that exact scene occurs, I think, in the third Indiana Jones film, the third and final Indiana Jones film, uh, right? And they decide, they're like, we should go to blank. No, we shouldn't. We should go to Berlin. And they go to Berlin. So, yeah, it's a choice point. And, and it's dramatized as a choice point. But let's talk a little bit about other things that are at crossroads. 
Well, one interesting thing is, you know, crossroads are crosses. So of course you can, you can layer in a certain additional amount of symbolic resonance if you consider that, right? They are literally crossroads. And crosses, okay, as a, as a symbol have, you know, a number of sort of important um, resonances if you look at them sort of through a depth psych lens, right? If you consider the Jungian interpretation. So one of course is that the, the cross, you know, has that tension of opposites, right? The potential to go in any direction has, it sort of pulls apart. And in that sense, it is like the crucifixion, right? Which, which pulls, you can't see my arms, but uh, which pulls, right? Christ on the, on the cross is pulled between opposites, up, down, right? He's literally a cross. It also has the, the binding property, right? The cross is quadrate, right? It's, it's four. Um, and so, you know, it, it calls things like the functions, right? The four functions in Jungian thinking. And this idea that like, oh, right. Like one function is up, two functions are out and then one function is down, right? Um, so function theory emerges. And there are lots of things. I mean, if you look into the sort of the archetypal aspects of the number four, but in particular, this, this intersection, Jung has a whole passage in his book with Wolfgang Pauli about um, synchronicity, where he talks about the, the cross as being about matter and energy, right? And sort of causality and a causality as a more complete picture of the world. That's pretty abstract for most people. Some people really into it, pretty abstract for most people. But the point is, right? The cross has this conjunction. It's a meeting of things and often of sort of two worlds. Um, a number of years ago, I went to go see um, a, the Philip Glass um, musical. I guess it's a musical opera. It's an avant-garde piece, art piece. It's musical, I guess, right? Called Einstein on the Beach. And the opening of Einstein on the Beach, which you can watch online, is this extremely long sequence where there you start with two horizontal bars. Okay, so you, you, YouTube it, I'm sure. But you start with two horizontal bars, okay, that are like lit at a black stage. So you're sitting in the audience and you're watching this two horizontal bars. And what happens is that the, the people who are the main performers are sort of also acting as the chorus and they're chanting, okay? And they're saying something like, um, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, one, 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 two, three, one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, 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 two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, one, three, one, two, three, four. Okay, you get an idea. So they're just variably counting between one and four in that sequence. So it's an ascending one through four sequence, but you know, it's a variable in terms of and seemingly random in terms of what they get. It's unsettling. Simultaneously, you get these two big lit bars on stage, okay? And like long, thin kind of like lit bars. And what happens is that over the course of a fairly long period of time, 10 minutes, 15 minutes or something, the, the one bar gradually becomes upright, but gradually, like imagine what it takes to go from horizontal to vertical, right? And then spread that across 10 or 15 minutes. It's so incremental as to be almost imperceptible. But what happens is that this gradually occurs until what was two bars in parallel becomes a crossed bar while people are doing this. One, two, three, four, one, two, one, two. Whew, let me tell you, a powerful experience. Now, some of you are like, what? Okay, and that's fine. You know, performance art, not everybody's cup of tea. Admittedly, I don't attend a lot of things like this, although I like a good play. Um, this one was very low on narrative content, but that experience powerfully stuck with me. And one of the things that it did, of course, was provoke all of these interesting associations about the parallel versus the crossed, right? What it means to be versus what it means to be orthogonal. Think about those things. It's different to be parallel than it is to be orthogonal. And to be orthogonal means not even necessarily to be at cross purposes, right? You're not opposed in some sense. You're just operating in two totally different dimensions, but, but, and like literally two totally different dimensions, but crossroads is where all that comes together. It's kind of crux point. It's a kind of axis mundi, right? Axis of the world on which things turn. And you can see that reflected in lots of cultural and magical practice, right? It's not uncommon, for instance, in certain kinds of syncretic um, folk magical traditions, right? Um, uh, voodoo and that kind of thing. Uh, Santeria, 
um, to use the crossroads for various sorts of things, either to do magic at the crossroads or to bury things at the crossroads in order to like empower them, collect powers, you know, people that pass over the crossroads, the thing is buried under the ground there. I've often wondered actually, and I've been meaning to write it into a book for, for years, but I often wonder when Hurricane Katrina swept in and, and sort of smashed New Orleans and the surrounding area, um, there must've been a lot of dirt roads uh, in that state around New Orleans where things that had been buried for a long time washed up. And I'm sort of curious what would have washed up when the floods came through because there were probably things buried at some of those crossroads that have been buried for 150, 200 years longer, right? Poppets, voodoo charms, right? Little satchels put together with bits of people's hair and bits of money to try to compel love. And they were buried at crossroads because they're places of power, places of choice and places of power. Notably, that power is not always positive. It can be quite um, dangerous. And one way that it can be dangerous is that one of the classic myths that involves crossroads, right, is to um, meet the devil at the crossroads. In fact, the song Crossroads, which is a Robert Johnson song originally, although there's a, a quite good Eric Clapton performance I can't remember if it's Eric Clapton solo. No, I think it's when he was in Cream, if you guys follow 60s rock. So Eric Clapton, very competent English guitarist, um, when he was in Cream, uh, did a version of the song Crossroads. You'll turn it up. But Robert Johnson did this song Crossroads. And it's part of a general mythology in blues and in rock about selling your soul to the devil at the crossroads in order to gain the ability to play the guitar or play music. There's a bunch of different variations of this. As an American folk story, it goes way back. But of course, it also traces into, you know, European culture as well, right? And this idea, you meet the devil at the crossroads, or you meet the black dog at the crossroads. The crossroads are a place where you can bargain. You can choose which way you go. And in a certain sense, to deal with the devil is almost a choice to send one part of yourself in one direction and another part in another direction, right? It's a bit like a bit like cutting your shadow off of your feet because what do you do when you sell your soul at the crossroads? Well, you're aiming for worldly success, right? Your conscious life poof, takes off. But at the same time, you've sold your soul to the devil. And what does that mean exactly? You can take it literally. It's like, oh yeah, the devil. You could take it literally. <laughs> I don't know how literal that particular vision of the devil is for people, but anyway, you could take it literally and be like, oh yeah, what you're doing is bargaining with a supernatural entity who is the enemy of God and who offers people sort of deals, right? In, in keeping with its sort of biblical uh, predecessor. Okay, so you could look at it that way. Um, but, you know, let's see if we can cast it into a slightly more, you know, uh, abstractly archetypal light and see what we can get out of it. What does it mean to make a deal with the devil? And what does the devil do? The devil tempts. But what's tempt? Well, tempt, tempt means a few different things, right? Because you can just tempt somebody with, you know, and you, I'm sure, have been, as most of us, probably all of us, have been at some time or another, tempted with thoughts like, Nobody will ever find out. That's a kind of temptation, right? Nobody will ever find out, right? Usually chased with something like, and what people don't know doesn't hurt them, right? The, the chaser justification in case you were feeling bad. And you know what? Sometimes that's true. Um, sometimes it's true, but a lot of the time it isn't. Um, and, right? What are the other forms of temptation? All you have to do is give me this and I'll give you that, right? So the classic temptations, for instance, in, in, in the Bible, right? The Christian temptations, the three temptations of Christ. And what are the three temptations of Christ? Okay, so the first temptation, geez, am I going to get this in right order? Yeah, totally. Okay, the first temptation of Christ is, you know, Christ is in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. And of course, the devil shows up and... You know, this is a classic thing to sit in the circle and wait through this is a religious theme you'll see all over the place. Buddha, same thing, right? Buddha sits under the Bodhi tree and Mara, the god of sex and death, comes and starts tempting him with sex and death, right? Scaring him and tempting him, 
right? Because he's ascetic. But Christ basically goes through the same thing and he sits in the desert 40 days, 40 nights, and the devil comes to him. And the devil first, you know, says, You're hungry. If you're the son of God, right? If you are sort of divinely powerful, change these stones into bread. And uh, Jesus responds, um, man does not live by bread alone. And then the second thing is, uh, you know, he, geez, let me think. Oh yeah. The second thing he is, he takes uh, Jesus to the highest mountain in the world. And because uh, the, the Bible is a flat earth document, basically, um, he can see all the nations of the earth spread out before him. This is what I felt like the last time I rode Leviathan at Canada's Wonderland. So he saw all the nations of the earth spread out before him, right? You can see. And the devil said, I will give you command of all of these. I'll make you king of the earth if you bow to me. And Jesus basically says nothing doing. And then last, he's like, okay, well, if you're so important, he takes him to the temple. Maybe I've got those last two reversed. But the point is, he takes him to the temple and he says, if you're the son of God, hurl yourself off and angels should catch you. And it's like, one does not, you know, tempt God, basically. So you don't make demands about miracles. And he rebuffs the devil. But the point here is, what's the deal? The devil is proposing certain kinds of equitable exchange, right? Where he's going to give him something in exchange for certain kinds of behavior, right? kneeling before him, abase, abase yourself before me, acknowledge your power, my power, and renounce yours. Which if we want to code, right, is like turn your face away from, turn your face away from the self and the difficulties of appropriating your own self-development and instead, you know, come to the dark side. Come to the dark side. That's classic temptation. Come to the dark side. Now, the dark side has some good things. As the crossroads story about, you know, Robert Johnson and, and the devil indicates, it's fairly, fairly clear that hell probably has all the best musicians, mm. right? The sex, drugs, and rock and roll ethos that characterizes that side of things, powerfully tempting, powerfully tempting. So temptation and meeting the devil at the crossroads. And these are choices that we make. And if you want to ground that out in very real terms, right, you don't have to go into the ultra mythological. You can just ask yourself, you know, like, how much of my soul is it going to cost me to, to do this thing, to achieve this level of success or that level of success? You know, one of the first jobs I ever had, I worked in, in advertising. <laughs> Anyway, one of the first jobs I ever had, I worked in advertising. Uh, first, I was a dropout. Then I was an inventor. That's its own story. Um, and then I got some attention from a venture capitalist and a developer guy. They introduced me to somebody else, and blah, 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 blah. And finally, I ended up getting a pitch, and I started working for this, this agency. And during the period where I earned enough money, my friends, um, I was poor on either side of it. So my friends used to call this period the blip. So I worked for this ad agency. And the thing was, interesting work. And I was good at it, you know, uh, interesting work. And I was good at it, but it didn't leave me anything. <laughs> it didn't leave me anything. I had no juice left over for my own creative endeavors after a full day. And further that creative energy, my creative energy, my insight, my whatever was all getting poured into what? Selling people shit they didn't need. I hope some of you took my previous indication that you should watch the documentary Century of the Self. And I highly recommend you chase it with the other Canadian or the Canadian documentary, rather the other documentary, which is Canadian, not other Canadian, uh, the corporation, just to get an idea. But like we live in a particular culture where devil's bargains are somewhat de rigueur, right? And that's always kind of the case. We're always being asked at some level to abase ourselves for worldly success and sacrifice things sometimes that we suspect we ought not to sacrifice. And this was one of those cases for me, right? It was like, I don't know how I feel about this. I don't know how I feel about using my abilities to sell people shit they don't need because that's what advertising is. If you need it, you go look for it. Advertising is just secular applied propaganda. It's designed to make you buy things you don't need. And of course, they've also now, modern society has engineered need through planned obsolescence. So things are designed to a very fine tolerance to break and usually to break shortly after your warranty has elapsed. This is 
quite deliberate, right? But then also obsolescence. I need the new style. I need the new model. Oh, my shoes aren't in anymore. But then also things fall apart. This is the world we've created for ourselves because we need you to buy stuff again. Anyway, enough railing about that. The point was that it was crossroads moment for me because boy, was I raking it in. I'm making good money. And after a period of poverty and it, it was, it felt good. It felt good to be able to buy things for my friends. Right? It felt good to be able to go out and not worry about it. I spent like an obscene amount of money on Christmas that year, right? And not because I was really trying to show off, just because it felt good to be able to do it, right? It felt powerful to be able to do it. But at what cost? And it was a crossroads moment. And interestingly, and maybe, I don't know, encouragingly, I went down the one road, got maybe a mile down the road, and then I stopped and said, actually, no. <laughs> Turned around and went back. I, like, I left that job, the blip, uh, and did other things. And then for me, it was a long period in the wilderness. Um, and as you will discuss in the second video, the second video I'm gonna extend talking about sort of the hero's journey and the developmental cycle and Jung's notion of development and expanding that a little bit with my notion of development. So you'll sort of see that, but crossroads, that's crossroads. Now, the other thing is thresholds, and that's the difference between a, thrush, a threshold and, a, and a, uh, a crossroad. A crossroad, yeah, it's a choice, but actually, in theory, you can turn around. You could go back. It's usually not totally irrevocable, right? It's consequential, generally speaking. But a threshold is different, because once you've passed the threshold, things have changed. You know, you can think about it in a little bit as kind of a point of no return in some sense. And so what's the point of no return? You ever seen the movie about the um, NASA astronauts, Apollo 13? It gives you an idea of the point of no return, right? So, you know, here, here's Earth and here's Moon. And the point of no return is the point at which it would take you more effort and energy to turn around and go back than it would for you to see the whole thing through. And that's what happened with Apollo 13. Right? Their, their mission got screwed up, but it got screwed up and they were far enough into things that they frankly had no choice. All right? It would have been more expensive, more difficult right, for them to turn around and try to go back than it would for them to just follow the damn thing through. And so they did right, in a state of you know, like screwed up equipment and whatever. And there was that period of time where they went around right, to the dark side of the moon and then circled back and you know, for a while, uh, Everybody at NASA held their breath because it's like, are they going to die out there? That came up a fair bit in uh, Astronauts, which we'll talk about later. I'm quite fascinated. And with the anniversary of the moon landing last year, a lot of this is fresh for me. So anyway, the point is the point of no return, right? Um, now, sometimes that point of no return for us is an illusion. That's a sunk cost fallacy, right? The idea it's like, oh, but I've invested so much time and effort. I can't change now. And usually that is a question that requires a significant amount of reweighting because the thing is, it's like, really, you can't? Because maybe this is destroying you, right? Or maybe this isn't who you want to be anymore. You can have made a decision and then make a different decision. You can make mistakes. And people, generally speaking, do not allow themselves to make mistakes. It's a powerful, powerful urge, right? Cognitive dissonance is the thing. And if you're familiar with the concept of cognitive dissonance, right? Psychological concept of cognitive dissonance, it's like once you've made a call, your brain will work overtime to justify that call, right? In some ways, it, you know, and, and you see this reflected in people psychologically, people often respond more powerfully to somebody who makes a sudden and decisive decision than a measured one. They don't care at the end of the day what the decision is, right? And they'll just fit themselves to it, right? So if you look into the science around cognitive dissonance, you'll see what a powerful urge this is for people. And so that gives us a false sense of the point of no return. We're like, well, in for a penny, in for a pound. It's like, no, no. <laughs> it's like saying in for a penny, in for a dollar. No, in for a penny, in for a penny, right? You don't necessarily have to go in for the whole dollar. Well, yeah, but I would contradict myself. Mm, yeah. And isn't that a sign at some level that you're you know, being reflective? like that you're thinking about things, everybody makes mistakes. Everybody, everybody makes mistakes, but people have an extremely hard time with that. And for some people it's you know intolerable, un unacceptable, totally unacceptable because to admit a mistake would be to admit some kind of basic flaw, right? Some kind of basic flaw in their being. 
if I'm wrong about this, what else am I wrong about? And all of a sudden the looming terror of self-examination, right? Oh, Halloween callback. So certainly it is the point, right? Or certainly it's the case that we tend to overestimate the point of no return, the threshold. But there are other cases where, where we don't, where stepping over the threshold marks a transition into a new kind of thing. And that's what the threshold is, right? The threshold is the space inside the door and you're moving from one space to another. You notice how in Western vampire stories, you have to invite the vampire in a lot of the time. They can't get in without your invitation. So they'll, we, they'll figure out ways to trick you to get your invitation. But once they're across the threshold, then you're in danger. If you don't invite them in, right? You're not in the same kind of danger. Uh, note, I add, that actually also corresponds quite neatly to these stories of devil temptation that we're talking about, because these stories very often correspond to a model where somebody is sort of sitting inside a protected circle, and on one level or another, the temptations of the devil come down to come out of the circle, and it will be, right, hitting you with um, whatever it's got, right? It'll try to terrify you, intimidate you, deceive you, um, promise you things, right? It'll hit you with whatever you've got. If you're looking for a more grounded psychological version of this, this is a bit like addiction, okay? So when you have addiction on you, you've got a demon in your head that has certain ideas about what it wants you to do. And those ideas typically bend towards, you know, give me what I want. And it does not care. If you're a serious addict, it doesn't care about deceiving people. It doesn't care about your other relationships. It doesn't care about... Um, the rest of your life. It just does not care. It will feed those things into the fire in a heartbeat to get what it wants, right? And that's the problem. When people have a serious addiction, they're bargaining with a demon. And the thing is smart. It's smart. And when I say like it's smart, I mean, literally, like it's composed of brain tissue. It's an alternate system, which is impinging on your system inside your own head. It's biological. And that alternate system is effectively you know, in the terms in which we're speaking, demonic. I don't mean that it's literally a spiritual entity, and I don't think so, right? Or that's not my natural inclination, but it's demonic. It tempts, twists your thinking, it promises you things just this one time, this will be better, uh, you'll feel great, you know, whatever. Like it'll promise you whatever you want. So that's a grounded version, but that temptation, that quality, right, is present in so many things, that devil and temptation quality. Crossing the threshold is stepping out of the circle. And once you do that, things change, right? Things are gonna change, often in a way that is irrevocable. Okay. So the question, of course, that is floating around right now, one of the questions that's floating around is, to what extent is the situation, right, south of us in the States, a threshold, a crossroad, People are asking these very hard questions, right? The road to 270 is what they always have, right? It's like electoral college seats. And we watch the numbers count up because that's the threshold. It's a threshold after which things change, things don't change, whatever it is, whatever expectations people have. But people are also asking questions, of course, obviously, right? Voting is a choice par excellence. Would that we had ranked voting choices in uh, Western nations more often, but don't get me started about voting systems. I could go on all day about that. So the point is, right, that crossroad, it's a crossroad and very much, right, archetypally speaking in the States, it's a huge crossroad. So I grew up in the 90s and the 90s were the end of the Cold War. The world had been split in half between two titanic rival ideologies. And then suddenly, against all of the pundits' expectations, right, against all the projections and the expertise, the Soviet Union suddenly in 1991 just imploded. It just gave it up. It turned out it had been wildly inefficient the whole time, and it just suddenly, and then there was one thing standing, the hyperpower, the end of history, ha, huh. <laughs> right? The end of history. Does it feel like history has ended to you? I was lucky enough to be teaching a history class uh, let me think four years ago. And so I kept hitting this, like history is not the study of the past. It is the study of the flow of human events, which includes the present. And right, and the student was like, blah, 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 blah. And then Brexit happened. And so of course I had the great pleasure slash despair of being able to say this, see, what, see how you're feeling right now? Welcome to history, right? This is what we're talking about. This is an event, it's consequential, it's happening now. And you can see the precedent of it, right? And you can see, you know, the, the inflow and the outflow and the connection and, right? 
get a sense of this, that's history, right? So, but in the nineties, history, the end of history, the hyperpower, yada, yada, yada. But now of course, around the globe, we're asking ourselves, the hyperpower is internally divided quite badly and quite evenly, it seems like. And it's no longer a question, it seems, of being able to sort of put together a compromising team that's gone out the window. And I, I have theories and ideas about this. <clears throat> Facebook plays no small role, but theories and ideas about this, but the point is it's true. It used to be that the world was divided, but then the hyperpower became the lead house and now it's a house divided. And so of course, everybody is asking the question, they stepped over a threshold, which way is this crossroad gonna go?